Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to be doing a two-year ownership review update of my 2011 BMW 535i six-speed manual transmission F10 sedan. It's almost hard to believe I've owned this car over two years now. I bought it back in the beginning of 2022, and I've made a couple videos on it, but really I haven't done many updates on this car, and it's been kind of my daily driver in and out. I have a couple other vehicles that I drive, but this one is kind of my go-to vehicle, especially when I'm going on the highway or any meaningful distance. I've had a few requests to do an update video on it, and I figured that's a good idea. I mean, there's a lot of people looking to buy these cars. Obviously, they're all used. People wanna know reliability. What is the ownership experience like? I have a lot of pros and cons about this car, but overall, I do enjoy it. I've kept it two years, so I must like it to some degree. And this one is unique since it is a manual transmission, so we'll definitely touch on some of those nuances as well. And also as part of this, I'll give you a breakdown of what it's actually cost me to keep this car running and be reliable in the slightly over two years I've owned it. We'll do a cost per day, a cost per month, and also a cost per mile, just so you can get an idea of what these vehicles take to keep on the road. Now let's start off with some of the negative items I've found in my ownership of this car. The first items I'll point out are specific to the manual transmission. So many people aren't gonna have to worry about this because most of these cars were automatic, but a few of them were six speed manuals. And I think it's important to point out kind of their nuances and faults. Um, the first one being, when you put this car into first gear, you have to be sure it is all the way into first gear. Occasionally, you can get it halfway into gear, and it feels like it's gone into first gear, but as you start to release the clutch and move forward, it will pop out of first gear and provide you with a very jarring, loud bang. And if you have any passengers in the car, everyone will think your engine just blew up. <laughs> so... That's something I've learned as I've gotten used to how this transmission behaves. You really have to feel that first gear slide in properly. There's basically two notches. If you get kind of that half notch feeling, you know you're not all the way in first gear. You have to get all the way in. It's almost a two notch type of feel. Now, most of the time this isn't a problem, but occasionally it will catch you off guard, especially if you're on an uphill sitting at a stoplight and um, you quickly need to put it in first gear, you may find yourself getting it halfway into gear and you just have to think, oh gosh, I have to double clutch it or put it in a second, then slide it back into first to make sure it's securely there. Next with the manual transmission is fourth gear is a little notchy to get into. Um, it doesn't really matter what RPM you're at. I've noticed the lower RPM, it's a little bit smoother. Um, it's not like it grinds or anything, but it does take a bit more effort to get into fourth gear. You know, it's, it's it's not a big deal, really. Yeah, the next thing that's pretty much manual transmission related is the off idle throttle response. It is unpredictable, to say the least. When you have the clutch depressed, it's like the engine is more responsive to throttle inputs. It responds faster. And when the clutch isn't depressed, it is so lethargic and basically it's the throttle pedal's dead you have if you slammed it to the the floor the rpm would not raise with what the speed you would expect it to it's very slow and also as you're releasing the clutch sometimes the engine rpm with the same amount of throttle input will spike and then sometimes it will just kind of stay what you would expect it to be stay around 1500 to 2000 rpm so it, it i would say you have to be very you have to really finesse the throttle pedal but honestly it, that's not the case. It's it's mostly unpredictable, which is unfortunate. Uh, but I think it really comes down to, you know, how BMW controls throttle on these N55 engines. It doesn't really stand out with the automatic so much because you're not trying to mix throttle with clutch. But it's really obvious in a manual transmission. So BMW does not employ a throttle body to control engine RPM. It uses a an actuator motor to change the duration of the intake valves, and that is how it controls uh, engine speed. That's how it controls how much air is getting into the engine. So you're bound to have some disconnected feeling because it's all throttled by wire. It is a very complex system. Um, they did that to basically give it better fuel economy and improve uh, engine performance after you have uh, left from a stop. So really that's something that you really only feel if you have a manual transmission, but there is that slight disconnect, um, especially coming off idle. Moving on from transmission things, now we're getting to more just regular F10 type faults and nuances. First is with the suspension. 
overall it's it's very good but when you start getting to a washboard type road or, or a pothole or something like that inevitably you're going to hit it even if you try to avoid it if you live especially in the midwest the roads are imperfect and i will say the suspension feels a little uh, juddery or um, not very well composed when it's very rough roads you get a bit more clashing sounds coming especially through the front and I've gone all over the suspension on this car. It's not brand new, obviously, but the suspension actually is in very good condition. I think it's just the way the car is built. It's not quite as stable feeling in the front end. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it has something to do with how they've mounted the sub subframe to the body or something, but it, it does give you kind of an odd sensation when you're going over rough road. And there's sometimes some noise associated to that. Now getting into the interior here, an annoyance I've noticed is when you go to turn the car off, you have to hit this button twice. And maybe that's normal for these push button start type cars. And this is the first one I've ever owned that does it. So I mean, it's just getting used to it, but you have to push it twice to fully turn off the car. Because if you only push it once, the engine will turn off, but your instruments and your, your iDrive system and everything will stay on and it'll stay on for like a couple minutes before it shuts off. And that really runs down the battery if you don't actively push this twice to turn everything off. So definitely keep that in mind so you keep your battery health in good condition. Another odd thing I've noticed is that if I haven't driven the car for maybe a week, I go to turn it back on, the radio station doesn't stay on the last station that I had it on. It won't even be on a radio station at all. It'll basically clear its memory of where it was the last time it was used. It still remembers all the presets, but it, for whatever reason, does not go back to its previous state. A little bit annoying, but obviously not a huge deal. When the car is idling, I've noticed the idle is not the smoothest, which is odd because an inline six should be basically the smoothest engine you could possibly buy. If you look online, there's tons of reports with the N55 just kind of having a slightly rough idle. And it's not rough enough to where it even displays on the tachometer it stays pretty much dead on it like 600 ish rpm but you can definitely kind of feel it it's it it's not smooth like you'd expect an inline six to be now i've gone over everything on this car i've checked for vacuum leaks i've checked for boost leaks i've checked the spark plugs and ignition components and i've replaced everything that looked like it could be a potential culprit and while I think I've improved it with all the things I've done, it's still kind of there. I, I think that's just the nature of this, this engine, especially in higher mileage, perhaps. But again, it doesn't really affect anything other than just when you're sitting at a stoplight and it's just sitting there idling, you do feel some a bit of rocking. And uh, it's unfortunate, but that's just, I think, the nature of the N55 engine. When you go to unlock the car, you push the unlock button once and it unlocks the driver door only. When you go to push it twice, it'll like sometimes unlock, unlock all the doors, but it definitely turns on all the lights. But if you want to unlock the passenger door, so you have someone coming to ride with you and you want to unlock all the doors, you have to push that unlock button on your fob like three or four times to ensure the doors will be unlocked so when they go to open the door, they can actually get in. I've found that quite frustrating at some times because most of the time I won't even try to use the fob to unlock all the doors. I just know that I have to get in first and hit the manual button on the dashboard to then unlock all the doors. And then when we're talking about the key fob itself, it eats batteries like crazy. I am I am honestly shocked. It, uh, it'll chew through a battery in a month or so, you know, four weeks is really all you'll get. And it doesn't matter if you use name brand batteries, aftermarket batteries, they all are dead in four weeks. Now you can still obviously start the car with a dead battery, but it's just annoying. You know, sometimes I'll have it in my pocket and when the car won't start easily with it in my pocket, I know the battery's starting to die. So you basically have to have a, a inventory of batteries to replace them ad hoc whenever they're needed. And the last fault I'll call out on this car is how easily it is to bend wheels on it. You'll notice that the wheels are not the same ones I had when I first showed you this car, and that's because I've replaced them. I had to straighten those wheels more than, I think it, it twice I had to re get the wheels straightened, and I just couldn't get them properly balanced ever after that point, so I went ahead and found some really good condition uh, M Sport wheels and they look great on the car I think but these are straight and I'm just <laughs> keeping my fingers crossed that they will stay straight 
because it doesn't take much of a pothole to bend these things. And some of that might be because the wheels are too soft compared to the weight of the car, but also the run flat tires. Uh, they transfer basically all the impact to the wheel. And I think that promotes bending the wheel. Right now, these wheels have run flat tires. I will keep them on there just because they're great tread and they're expensive. So I'm not gonna just throw them away. But when it comes time to replace these tires, I will not put run flats back on. All right, so that is all the negatives that I wanna touch on. I wouldn't take any of them as a reason to not buy this car because the positives I think still far outweigh the negatives. Every car is gonna have negatives, you know, just things you, you realize after you've owned it for a while, you've lived with it for a while. So let's hit these positives now. First of all, this car gets great miles per gallon, I think, especially on the highway. It gets a genuine 28 to 29 miles per gallon on the highway at 75 miles per hour. It's really nice for a car this big with the amount of power it has, and the amount of comfort it has to get that kind of fuel economy. Now in town, it definitely suffers. I'd say especially so with the manual transmission, it's just a lot of weight to start moving from a stop. So, I mean, you really start burning a lot of gas, uh, you know, coming from stoplights to stoplight. You know, in town, you'll see realistically 18 miles per gallon, which is what it was rated from the factory for. So it's, it's a believable number. A car like this is, I think that's excusable especially when you want that manual transmission experience. Another positive of this car is just how refined and quiet it is on the highway. Whenever my wife and I go on a trip of any meaningful distance, there's not even a question what car we're gonna take. It is this one. It is so comfortable, such a serene driving experience. Then we get to the power this car makes. Now it's not a V8. It is the N55 inline six turbocharged engine, but really it, it has adequate power. Tons of passing power when you're at 75 up to, you know, well above that, it'll get up and go just fine. One feature I really like, and this is an upgrade that you can get, are these soft closed doors. It adds a lot of complexity to the whole door hinge mechanism, but once you have it, you really can't go back. You don't have to slam doors anymore. It's so really useful if you're pulling groceries out of the car and you just need to shut the door. You can just let it kind of glide shut on its own. It shuts it. You don't have to worry about, is the door closed all the way or not? It takes care of that. The interior, kind of going with the comfort side of things. This car is incredibly comfortable. It has a lot of leg room. The seats are so supportive, comfortable. I've never sat in the the sport seats, but I imagine that these are probably more comfortable than the sport seats just because the bolstering isn't as extreme. It's very easy to get in and out of, to slide in and out of the seat, especially in the front. The rear has a ton of room back here. I mean, this is basically a limousine. <laughs> yeah, no complaints with the ergonomics or anything about that. The audio system is incredible. Um, it's just the basic audio system. I don't think it's anything special, but it sounds great. It is definitely the nicest audio system I've ever had in a car. Heated seats work wonderful in the winter time. They heat up fast. It doesn't have a heated steering wheel, but the seats definitely get super hot. I think they have three stages you can set them on. Very nice convenience to have there. Now let's talk about the headlights. These, this car has the adaptive headlights, and I think it's a sweet feature, really. You really notice it, especially in like neighborhoods and slower speed. When you turn the wheel, the headlights will turn into the corner so you can see much better than a standard headlight system also if you are on a crest or something the headlights will point up and down as needed of course it's more things to go wrong should it break but gosh when it's working it is an amazing thing to have and the last few positives that i will say are just the looks of the car i love the look of the f10 in my opinion it is the last truly good looking 5 series bmw made if you look at the g30 it just looks a little too much buick and if you look at the the newest i don't even know the chassis number of the newest 5 series but it, it looks terrible like it just is not a good looking car um this looks proper bmw and uh i i, I love just staring at this car it is beautiful and then lastly obviously is the manual transmission. Now I know the automatics are great in this car, but there is just something special about being able to shift your own gears, have a third pedal, even with all the nuances that go along how this 
throttle response has been tuned on this car. Once you get going, this car is so sweet to row your own gears. I love it. It gives this car a different dynamic that you just won't get with an automatic transmission. And it, you're never going to get this ever again. I mean, it, it, you'll never get a 5 Series. This is the last in the line of manual transmission big sedans like this. Very unique, very cool. Now, let's look at what this car has actually cost me to run in the two years I've owned it. Honestly, this is one of the first times I've sat in the back seat of this car. I don't get this experience too often, but this is a total limousine of a car. Anyway, let's look at this. So I've documented all the expenses during my ownership of this car, which comes out to 796 days. And I've divided this up into things that were required to be done, maintenance and repairs. And then I've also got extra things I've done as preventative maintenance that you don't necessarily have to do. I just wanted to do it while I was there. So let's look at this. The first thing on the list relates to the accessory drive. So your accessory belt and the idler pulleys and the tensioner and all that. Um, I, re I decided this was a required maintenance item because if that goes wrong, um, that accessory belt, not only do you lose your alternator, but it could go into the front crank seal and really, really cause some serious issues with the engine. So I just preventatively replace this and I recommend anyone do that. It came out to $110.91. Next is bent wheel repairs. So I had to get those straightened and balanced twice, which came out to $278. It's just part of owning an F10 for whatever reason. They just bend wheels like crazy. Next is body maintenance. So the windshield cowl was in very poor condition. Water wasn't draining properly, so I replaced that. Replaced the windshield wiper blades. Got some touch-up paint. Had to replace the xenon headlight bulbs. Had to replace the fender liners in the front. And obviously you have to replace a bunch of plastic rivets while you're in there. So that all came out to $400. I did have to replace the front wheel bearings. They were starting to click. So wheel bearings and the bolts to mount those came out to $263.29. Interior maintenance. Now I considered this required because I couldn't stand looking at a worn interior such as the buttons and, and kind of the paint coming off the buttons. It just makes it look kind of worn out. And, and rough. So I went through, replaced the trunk switch button cover, the iDrive button, um, the radio preset buttons, uh, fan control switch covers, start stop switch, um, just a lot of things. I got a leather die kit. I got a door handle kit because they get sticky. And I had to get a replacement key fob. And I only got one key fob with this car and that is not an inexpensive thing at $300 in itself. I don't like the idea of having a car like this with only one key. So I, I got a, an additional one. So all of that came out to $457.61. Then we get into just general mechanical maintenance, things like oil filter, changing the oil three times in the years I've had it, manual transmission fluid change, differential oil change, cabin air filter, brake fluid change and taking the brakes apart and lubricating everything, that came out to $349.44. And then a repair I had to make was the oil pan gasket. It was leaking pretty bad. So while I was in there, I not only replaced the gasket, but I replaced the engine mounts and replaced various bolts. While I was in there, I had to get a, a new tool and engine support bar. So to do that job in the entirety, it cost me $299.95. Then I dealt with a vacuum leak in my Kind of rooting around trying to find why the engine was not idling very well and i did find a vacuum leak at the upper charge pipe so i replaced that with an aluminum unit and all the o-rings to go into that came out to 210 dollars 77 cents and then lastly i did a walnut intake valve blast some people say the n55 doesn't need this i found that you know at the mileage the car had which was 92,000 when i bought it it definitely did need it um, there was quite a lot of buildup on the intake valves. So, you know, getting all the gaskets, getting the, the media blaster and the wand to fit the N55, all of that came out to $226.98. So that brings us to a grand total of required repairs to $2,596.64. So next we have all of the extra things that I did um, that I just, I wanted to make the car look better. I wanted to tackle maybe some issues that could potentially happen with the car. So we'll start off with 
getting some new wheels. I was tired of repairing the old wheels, especially since they weren't in the best condition cosmetically anyways. So I found these awesome 19 inch in sport wheels on Facebook Marketplace. I paid $850 for the wheels and then 8728 to get the TPMS sensors swapped out because oddly enough, the 2011 F10 uses different TPMS sensors than any later F10. Just a little tidbit to keep in mind if you have an early F10. Um, so total, after I sold the old wheels, that came out to $607. Then I wanted to add an oil pressure gauge uh, to the dashboard because one of the reported issues on the forums are N55s that destroy connecting rod bearings or, or eat through connecting rod bearings. Now this really stressed me out when I bought the car. I was like, what are you telling me? I have to proactively replace connecting rod bearings on this engine. And at the end of the day, I decided, no. The only thing I can reasonably associate to connecting rod bearings wearing out is sudden oil pressure drop. And the only thing I wanna do to keep my mind at ease was to monitor the oil pressure. So unfortunately, the car doesn't come standard with an oil pressure gauge, but it's not that hard to add one. Uh, so that's what I went ahead and did. And I'm glad I didn't replace the connecting rod bearings because honestly, that's just extra work that you don't need to do. It's The car is fine so long as the oil pressure is fine. And I've never had oil pressure issues in the entire two years that I've owned the car. So replacing all that and getting it set up was $479.08, which is significantly cheaper, not only in time, but in cost than re compared to replacing the bearings. Next, I did some cooling system preventative maintenance, such as replacing the expansion tank, uh, a plastic flange, switching that to a, an aluminum flange, replacing the tank cap and replacing the coolant, which came out to $141.31. And then I spent a lot of time trying to track down a pretty annoying uh, suspension knocking coming from the front of the car. And I replaced the sway bar bushings. I replaced various bushings and the control arm came out to $94.20. In the end, it was something really dumb that I should have caught earlier. And it was the old wheels, the center cap was loose and it was knocking <laughs> whenever you hit a bump. So the new wheels inevitably fixed that problem. And that was the only way I figured it out. I should have seen that earlier and I just didn't. And then lastly was my attempt to improve the throttle response. And I bought this race chip throttle response tuner. And I will say that it didn't do too much. It was $249. And honestly, it's, it's basically the same. Uh, the only thing this did was <laughs> if you have the clutch pedal pushed in, you can make the engine response faster, but its response off idle isn't any different. So for whatever reason, that that does not fix the, the clutch engagement problem that I was having. So all of those extra jobs, as I've turned them, was $1,570.87. So if we add both of those totals together, we come out to $4,167.51. So total repairs and maintenance that I've done to this car, 4,167. Now I've owned this car for 796 days. So if we average that cost per day, it would be $5.24 a day. And if we look at the monthly cost, it'd be $157.07 per month. I've driven this car a total of 8,874 miles. So I bought it with 92,230 miles and it now has 101,104 miles. So if we look at the cost per mile, that comes out to 47 cents per mile. Now, what we're not looking at here are, is the purchase price of the car, which was just under $13,000. The sales tax of that, which was, you know, 10% of that price. And what we're not looking at is insurance and registration costs because all those things are variable and those are fixed costs that you just have to pay up front. So I haven't included that in what my daily or cost per mile values are because you know, that's gonna vary based on what kind of deal you get on the car and all of that. So really just from a maintenance perspective, it generally costs for a F10 with around these miles, 47 cents per mile, and it also costs about $5.24 a day, generally. I've had a lot of questions of, are these cars expensive to maintain? Well, not really. 
if you take it in consideration of what German cars generally cost to buy and maintain, but this is a hard number based on my anecdotal experience of what you can expect to pay for an N55 manual transmission 535i. Now, of course, you can easily triple this number if you don't do the maintenance yourself. If you do it yourself, this is a realistic value, but of course, you, it all depends on the condition of the car you buy. If you have to buy new tires, that's easily another $1,200 you have to add to this cost. If you have to replace a turbo or a fuel pump, again, thousands of dollars can easily be added to this cost. Now, some of you might be wondering, well, why didn't you replace the water pump and all the spark plugs and all of that? Well, that's because I had maintenance records from prior to buying this. This car was serviced at the BMW dealer, all those components were replaced about 15,000 miles before I bought it, and I had records of that. So that is another thing to keep in mind. If you don't have records of those things, this cost per mile, cost per day could be a lot higher depending on what you need to replace on your 535. Obviously, if you do the maintenance yourself and the repairs yourself, you stand to save a ton of money. But there's one tool that you need to have in your arsenal should you do these repairs yourself. Let's take a look at that. And that tool I'm talking about is a tablet such as this Launch Sea Reader Elite 2.0. This is a diagnostic tool made specifically for BMW and Audi vehicles that will read things and tell you things that just your normal off-the-shelf OBD2 reader will not be able to let you see this has special reset functions that are specific to bmw this has special diagnostic procedures that are specific to bmw and this is also a bi-directional scanner that allows you to test components in the car by just the tap of a screen this sort of functionality usually costs thousands of dollars but this is a reasonable under 200 dollars tablet another nice feature of this tablet is that it comes with free lifetime updates so you're not stuck in 2022 or 2023 as they get new vehicles loaded into their system you can go to that upgrade section and update for free now obviously you can connect other vehicles outside of bmw and audi but this tool has the most comprehensive packages for those two brands if you're interested in one of these, be sure to look in the comments below for where you can buy one. Now, the reason one of these is so important if you're gonna have a modern BMW, it's because you might get an error code or you might have some weird running going on with the car and you need to see BMW specific error codes and BMW specific diagnostic procedures to kind of pinpoint what might be going on with the car. This is what a shop would use and typically they'll charge you a lot of money to do what basically this tool is doing. So let's get this hooked up with the car and see what all we can read. All right, so I've got the tool hooked up to the OBD2 port under the dash on this car. Starts reading all of the modules and any fault codes that live within it. So these are gonna be BMW specific fault codes. This is really important if you get a check engine light or some other sort of dash light, this will tell you exactly what is going on. And I know my car has a couple of codes stored in it. So if we look at this, under voltage battery, identification transmitter, eh, not really anything important. Junction box electrics, some sort of AUC sensor. Again, there's so many things that can get triggered by this um, it doesn't bother me if it's not throwing a light on the dashboard I'm not too worried about it these are things like <clears throat> Bluetooth aerial malfunction it probably is just means it's not equipped with it really more than anything but it's kind of cool that you can just do a general health report on these tools it's telling me well, maybe one of my mirror heaters is malfunctioning one of the door locks is sticking so that's a general report you can do you can share that if you want to email it out to someone or email it to yourself rather. Um, you can clear all the codes here. Pretty basic stuff for these sort of tools. Should we go back to diagnose? And we'll just go into BMW here. And we'll just manually search for 5 Series F10. You can do a health report. We can look at drivetrain, chassis, and body sections. We can get right into each one of these modules. So there's so many things you can dig into. But let's just do the engine control module to start. So you can read any fault codes, clear fault codes within this module. 
Um, and then the important part is down here in the actuation test. You can see you can activate electric fan, coolant pump, just all the components that this particular control module controls. If you have an electronic wastegate on the turbo, you can actuate that through here. All right, so we're in the special functions menu for the F10. Now we can choose maintenance. This is gonna be one of the most common flows you'll be going into, such as when you change the oil or do something like change the brake fluid, you can change the, or reset the maintenance intervals. Um, so there's a lot of things in here. Uh, you can set transport mode or take it out of transport mode, which is something I have actually had to do when I created a new key or had a new key created. They, for whatever reason, put it in a transport mode. Um, so that's important to take it out of that. So service record reset, service correction. You can do all those things there. Now let's look into special functions related to the engine. So you can see information about the injectors. You can re recode injectors through this injection quantity compensation. Um, you can do a startup following walnut blasting. I'm not exactly sure what that does. It may reset uh, intake volume parameters or something like that. Delete adaptations. You can adjust the idle speed. You can measure engine oil quantity. Do some sort of valvetronic startup procedure. Um, reset starter lock. You can do a starter exchange procedure. I'm not sure what all these constitute, but um, I'm sure if you're in there changing a starter, there's probably something you need to do. Here's another important one, startup of the oil circuit. So if you do open up the oil system, so you change the oil filter housing gasket, you will need to do the startup of the oil circuit to kind of prime the engine. So this makes sure the engine doesn't start. You know, just crank the engine continuously until it recognizes good oil pressure everywhere. So that's a very important procedure that otherwise, if you didn't have a tool to do it, um, you'd have to pull fuses and do all of this kind of somewhat sketchy stuff to get that same oil priming procedure to happen. So let's look at chassis. Brake bleeding routine, ride height sensor startup, steering angle sensor adjustment, ELV standardization and partial standardization. I'm not even sure what those are. Um, EPS teach in stop procedure. Lots of things. Now, I've never had to do any of these things, arguably, but you never know. If something randomly fails, these are the sort of recalibration procedures you will need to do. Initialize window lifter. So if you replace a, a window motor or regulator, you'll have to redo that. Seat standardization, sunroof, normalize the sliding and tilting, which I assume is setting endpoints actually. Block and enable remote key, change personalization data on the remote key. Evaluate battery state of charge. Let's see, calibration run of air distribution flap motors. Again, I had to do this on the Audi. If you change an a air flap actuator, more than likely you will have to run a recalibration procedure before that new actuator will actually work. Here's another one, heating and air conditioning functions, drain and fill the rich refrigerant circuit. So if you have to do any sort of AC compressor or Freon refill, I'm sure there's a procedure there you need to follow. Enable airbag activation after programming operation. Oof, I would want to stay away from that one. Register battery exchange. This is probably the most common function you would need from this tool. Um, anytime you change the battery on one of these cars, you do need to like register it to the vehicle, which means tell it what the expected amperage is, what the expected you know, cold cranky amps are, what the expected capacity of the battery is, um, because the car keeps tabs on that, but it has to have a starting point, a no starting point. Um, so there's a lot of complication resulting, but you need to have that. You can't just swap a battery out. Power tailgate initialization. I'm sure this, if you had to change the trunk motor, you uh, would have to run that. Driver assistance, if you have the all around vision camera, service function measure, data wheel electronics, just lots of things there. All right, so those are the special functions. So let's see, integrated chassis management. Yeah, I'm not gonna get into these things because I don't wanna screw anything up, but if you wanted to do some specialized coding for basically any module in the car, you could do that. Um, I don't mess with these things unless you absolutely have to because if you accidentally delete the existing coding, you may really end up in a tough spot. 
Um, so personalization, let's see what we got under that. So it says basically a warning here, um, basically saying if you screw this up, it's your fault. You can back up the coating before you mess with it, so that's good. I am not going to get into this because I just got nothing to gain by getting in here, but someone that knows that they want to change specific coating or the behavior a particular function of the vehicle could get in here and, and do as much damage as they want to do. Let's get into the transmission control module. Now this, I don't imagine, yeah, since it's not an automatic, it doesn't have a transmission control module, nor will it have a transfer case module. I'm curious about this secondary ECU. It doesn't have it. Okay. Interesting. This looks like this ECU was recoded in 2021. Obviously from here you can read the data stream. If you had the engine running, you can see voltages and other sensor readouts. It's helpful for tracking down kind of a intricate issue that doesn't just simply generate a check engine light or something like that. You can get into the ABS module, actuation test. You can actuate the pump motor, reset the control unit clear codes if you need. So that is a very fast overview of a fairly robust diagnostic tablet that is specific to BMW and Audi. You get similar amount of functions. Now you can get these kind of features through various means. Um, usually more expensive tablets have this. Um, there's usually an annual subscription fee which can start costing a lot of money if you end up needing this on over the course of multiple years. Same thing with some of those OBD2 uh, Bluetooth units you plug in that you use your phone. You get an app and you use your phone to kind of walk through these type of menus. Those also typically come with a an annual subscription that can quickly surpass the price of this tablet, which, you know, this, again, unlimited free updates, which is really the value proposition you get with this. So. Definitely recommend this if you are a DIYer or if you're just curious about the health of your car, this is the sort of tool you need to have on hand. So that's generally what it takes to own and operate one of these F10 535 BMWs. Now, I truly have enjoyed owning this car. I don't know how much longer I will own it because I'm always interested in other vehicles, but I can say I do not regret buying this car or keeping it around. And I would recommend those who are ready to take on the maintenance that these cars require to definitely go for it. That's all I have for this time around. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you all again next time.